Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about CDM. Specifically, we're talking about lessons learned. I'm going to throw it over to uh, Bruce, you at Palo Alto. No doubt you all have seen a lot of lessons learned as you've been with us on this journey. Uh, give us some of those highlights. You know, the lessons that we've learned have been all about humanity. It's about the, mm -hmm. the fallibility of humans and the scalability of humans. In our SOC internally at Palo Alto, we've only got nine people. And that's those nine people, they all live in the same time zone and they only work eight to five. Wait, that's nine really people possible. in the SOC at Palo Alto? That's exactly correct. That's nine impressive. People. And they are, like I said, all in the same time zone. They only, they only work eight to five. That's only possible with the efficient application of automation. Without it, we would have long since had some sort of major crisis. So that lesson learned was make sure that automation is, is a fundamental component of the security that you are building and the way that you respond to the things that you detect. Without it, you are going to suffer. Your people are, they're going to hate their lives. Nobody wants to deal with the low level alerts or false positives, all that garbage that, that Jeremy was talking about earlier. That garbage is just no fun. And to become efficient, automation was key to, to defending ourselves. No doubt, uh, you know, when you're, when you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, find, trying to find a needle in a stack of needles, uh, really important that there's not enough manpower in the world to do that. So totally get that and really do appreciate that, pointing that out. Gary, how about at Veterans Affairs? Uh, you all have been, you're, you're deep into it at this point. Uh, give us a couple of the lessons learned as you're rolling this stuff out in mass scale. Yeah, I'd say that um, the lessons learned is that it really requires, you know, it, it's a teaming effort. Um, I think at, at inception of the CDM program, it was really all about what did the Office of Information Security need to do? And, you know, ops was a secondary consideration. But what we've done is, well, obviously we realize that that's not the case, that we need ops as part of our, you know, shoulder to shoulder implementation. And so what we've done is we've really made this a collaborative shared programmatic office that looks holistically at what we need to do from a CDM perspective and then does what, what, what needs to happen, right? Um, I'd also say that CDM is not, you know, a separate and distinct activity that can be, that, that needs, that can be pursued independent of the larger ISCM strategy. It really is a holistic strategy that needs to be pursued across the entire enterprise. CDM is one facet of that, but then there's many facets of your larger ISCM program that you also have to consider. Um, and then I'd also say that it's all about the ability to operationalize the CDM program and then provide the visibility that, we, that I mentioned earlier to, to ensure that we have an understanding of, an, of our environment and then can make decisions based upon that understanding. And I, I would say that those really have been the lessons that we've learned over time. And again, uh, you know, if you look where we were and where we are today, we are far beyond, far, far more mature than we ever were eight years ago. No doubt, and uh, imparting some, some great wisdom on the community. Really do appreciate that. John, how about a micro focus? Lessons learned? There's many, uh, but if I had to pick one, it would be enterprise DevSecOps processes and tools. What we find in larger agencies is that um, each major program uh, is deciding how and when they do CI, CD, and with what tools. And that introduces a lot of unknown risks from a higher level CIO standpoint. And ultimately, you know, the, the best, uh, if you will, implementation of this that we've been a part of proudly uh, was at the Air Force, which uh, has uh, an amazing software factory. So what we've learned because of the, the solar winds and open source risks that federal agencies have now been exposed to and are aware of that uh, the enterprise level tools and processes are critical. Yeah, no doubt uh, the good old Kessel run and perhaps uh, Bruce was a part of that. Who knows? Uh, he might point that out. Richard, lessons learned you, as I said at the beginning of the program, you've been involved in this program, not quite from the beginning or perhaps from the beginning, but in the middle of a lot of heavy lifting over there. As you reflect back, lessons learned that you'd like to uh, uh, you know, communicate out there to the ecosystem. Yeah, the guests here have so many of them that I might take a bit while to put stump all of them. I'll start with the, the human element, right? Um, don't get overextended. I've learned this kind of firsthand. We, we get a sense from 
this partnership model that we're with agencies that there's always a emphasis to chase the next new thing, but we don't finish the things that we had started, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of the chasing the, the next big thing is, is can be problematic in some cases. So, you know, I would say focus and completing, you know, manageable chunks of work and then moving on you know, deliberately as opposed to kind of spreading your, your finite resources, your, your human, your, your expertise too thin is a huge lessons learned. Um, I would also say in a good way to cut corners, right? Cut unnecessary corners. Um, Jeremy had mentioned SaaS models, right? What we're finding is that in agencies that adopt SaaS services, the, the time to deploy the time to oper operationalization is much uh, more concise. Um, it doesn't take as long to build out infrastructure, to buy things, to physically deliver things. You can get off and running a lot faster. So I'm a huge proponent of that for, for a, lot of, a lot of reasons. Um, the other one that I want to mention also is, is enterprise approaches. Um, when it comes to some of these agencies, especially the heavy feder heavily federated ones, um, there's this kind of silos of autonomy sometimes that are, that are tough to tackle. And so at some point, you almost are doing 10 times the amount of work trying to get governance in place, trying to make decisions, trying to find strategies and integrate. Uh, if you're trying to integrate, for example, 10 different identity tools, much hard, larger uh, effort than, than doing one that applies to the enterprise at whole. Um, so I would really kind of focus on that from an agency's perspective as well. Try to get some semblance of a uh, found enterprise approach to your ISCM strategy, not the least of which will help a lot of the issues we've talked about today, right? Data quality comes easier. You're not inter integrating from 10 different data sources, it's not one. Um, you know, skill sets and training becomes a lot more streamlined. It has a lot of benefits, and it's one of those things that we've noticed time and time again that without that enterprise approach, things become complexities for both technical and non-technical reasons. Yeah, no doubt that uh, you know optimizing and simplifying uh, really sort of gains that efficiency. And you pointed out, uh, you know, buying it as a, acquiring it as a service, it's not only time to market, but it's just the the manpower associated to that, right? Uh, gets greatly reduced, and you can focus your attention on other things. So I really do appreciate those words of wisdom. Uh, Matt, how about at Tanium? Uh, can you give us the uh, top lesson learned that you all have been out there in the ecosystem help in, helping implement this capability? Top lessons learned is going to be difficult, but I'll, I'll take one that's certainly, I think, most broadly applicable. I think most of our customers uh, and agencies that we work with on a daily basis recognized like, like everybody else did, that when we went to a distributed workforce, many of the tooling and processes and procedures that we had in place just sort of fell over. Um, there was a significant dependence on uh, sort of niche tools that did a single thing. And when we moved the perimeter of the enterprise out to the endpoint and we went over disadvantaged networks and we had a heavy reliance on VPN connectivity and uh, we were working to gain access to applications that previously were only internal to the corporate network, when all of those changes happened, uh, we saw a lot of those tools fall over. And so we went from a significant focus on tool reduction and uh, reducing any overlap between tooling. And now there's an additional focus, sort of a resurgence on finding tools that can do more than one thing and, and have some overlap. So that if a single utility or a single function falls over, uh, you have the capability in another tool so that you can fall back or recover in many ways. So I think that we over-rotated a little bit on, on reducing uh, individual functionality to single tools. And I think that um, we're seeing agencies today uh, circle back on that and, and recognizing the need to have functional tools that are, are capable in, in any type of distributed work environment. Functional, robust, and a little bit of redundancy. It's a great catch there and a good point, uh, lesson learned for all of us. Uh, all right, well, we're going to... Um, Focus on the future here, and I want to start with you, Bruce, and uh, always like to uh, wrap this show up and talk about uh, paint a picture of the future, if you will. Tell us what it's going to look like in a couple of years as Palo Alto is pulling stuff out of the Petri dish, right? They've got it in early development. What's that demand signal that you all have been working on uh, that we can expect to see over the course of the next two to three years? Future is machine learning. It is. It has capability that lets us do things without a human in the loop that is extraordinary. Humans just don't have the scope of awareness to pull all these things together and operationalize them well at scale and do it at low latency. That latency in disconnected solutions slows everything down and it frankly it causes security challenges. 
we want to make sure that we are evolving to become more efficient. We want to reduce the mechanical entropy inside of us and subsequently inside of the agencies that use us. We're trying to make sure that we want to, that we are providing a solution that is designed to keep it simple, much like Matthew was talking about earlier. We want to keep things simple. We want to make sure that it doesn't become complex, that it, that it, that it is evolving towards efficiency and the graceful application of machine learning, the graceful application of automation, all of those things become components that contribute towards low detection times, low response times, and the efficiency of turning it into reality, making something actually happen. That is not easy to do. And so our focus over the next three years is gonna be taking those things that we've built and refining them, making them simple keeping them scalable at cloud scale and letting the agencies that use us evolve along with us. I hope that makes sense. Refinement, automation, a big part of keeping, uh, keeping these networks safe and keeping our country safe. John, how about at MicroFocus? You described a lot of different things you all are working on. What can we expect to see over the next two to three years? We believe the realization that data is the key and the crown jewel for hackers will emphasize the protection of data beyond data in transit and at rest, but also ultimately data in use through data tokenization and pseudonymization. And, and that's the key. If the data is um, useless to hackers, then the cost of a breach for both the federal government, but also you know, uh, companies globally will diminish dramatic, dramatically. Yeah, you know, I, I used to always would say that uh, the bad guys are not trying to get into these environments to look around and see how cool they are. Uh, they're getting in there to get, folk, to get access to the data, um, full stop. Matt, how about at Tanium? Uh, when, when we look around in a couple of years, uh, no doubt that you all are gonna have uh, uh, further developed and matured those environments into this sort of higher order activity that you're talking about. What can we expect to see at that point? I think at the end of the day, it really all just comes down to being able to paint a realistic and valid risk picture for decision makers at every different level. So uh, whether you're at the senior administrator level or you're an IT manager, everybody needs to understand what the, the risk picture is uh, under their purview. So being able to verify and trust your data, being able to reveal and protect your sensitive data at rest, being able to ensure configuration compliance and patching at scale uh, without any, any additional risk due to gaps, uh, being able to enforce policy at scale and understand that all of the machines that you're responsible for are visible and managed appropriately, um, just ultimately being able to paint that risk picture that makes sense to the people that are using the data. I think that's really what it all boils down to. Yeah, yeah. So, so key is that uh, multi-level uh, ability to, to, to take action on various uh, uh, types of data and dashboards, et cetera. I'm looking forward to that. Gary, how about at Veterans Affairs? You talked about a lot of stuff as containerization. If I'm head of software development in three years, what's at VA, what's that going to look like for me uh, as you've sort of rolled out this capability? Yeah, well, I really appreciate what uh, Matt just said. I mean, I think it is all about um, understanding the risks inherent within the systems to the finite level that needs to be understood at the particular tier that needs to understand it. Um, I'd say the predominant focus for the, for the department, just like many other departments, is encapsulating the vision that is outlined within the executive order 14028, um, which is really in implementing that ZTA, the multi-factor, the cloud, and ensuring that you have this holistic um, uh, capability uh, to understand risk, get that visibility that you need, ensure that cybersecurity has that seat at the table so that it's part of that decision-making process and the relevant leadership at the right levels are making those particular critical decisions they need to make. And that's all based on understanding your endpoints, you know, uh, uh, integrating the data, uh, protecting that data, ensuring that it has integrity. You know, the whole common set of things that uh, we, we normally just take for granted, but it really has to be part of this integrated effort that looks holistically and comprehensively at what we need to fundamentally achieve. And I think the EO is, is driving us towards that. Luckily at the department, we've got the secretaries directly engaged in, in cybersecurity as well as all the various tiers. And that has helped us immensely in, in ensuring that cybersecurity has that 
driving force behind it so that we can do what we need to do from that perspective. No question. There's a, there's a, a level of uh, awareness at the, uh, at the senior levels of the uh, federal service. And that was, uh, you know, done in, in a variety of means, including some, some, uh, some um, OMB memorandums. Uh, when you talk about zero trust architecture, I'll put you on the spot here. And I know it's a journey, you know, how long do you think it takes to realize that fully? Or do you ever realize that at Veterans Affairs? Uh, I know Palo Alto gave a, a timeline. We've heard of other companies. Is this a three-year journey, a five-year journey, a 10-year journey, a never-ending journey? Well, Luke, I'd say this is that um, I don't know that I'm prepared to provide a particular time frame for when we believe we'll be full up ZTA. Um, what we are doing is a, a thorough review of our full capability. We're looking at the NSA maturity model, the CISA model as well, figuring out where we are within that particular spectrum and then developing our comprehensive plan to get there. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say three years, five years, but what I would say is that we have a lot of capability that is already um, inherent within what they would refer to as a ZTA architecture. Mm -hmm. So it's really looking at those components that we have, figuring out where those deltas are, and then figuring out what makes the most sense for us to deploy. Because I, I think there was a, a comment earlier that says, everybody wants to chase a tool. Well, sometimes it's not about chasing a tool. Sometimes it's simply about addressing the human element, ensuring that there's integration, that there's that visibility that you need. And so it's really a comprehensive approach holistically to, to address that CTA perspective. But I would say we will get there. Um, I just can't give you, you know, a time frame that says, yep, in five years we'll be there. But I would say with what we have put in place, um, you know, we're moving in that direction. And that's awesome. And a lot of this is about taking the tools you have and stitching them together in that architecture that you're describing there. I think that's going to be a, a big aha moment for a lot of folks. Jeremy, how about at OCC? Uh, what's it going to look like in a couple of years? Yeah, the uh, just, just uh, you know, agree with so many of the comments that have been put out there by the rest of the group. Automation is really key for us. Again, as a small agency, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the number of uh, threats that we're dealing with, the number of requirements, they grow much more, much faster than we can ever hire to, to answer that solution, right? Like we, we have to think about how we do more with the resources that we already have. And automation is a huge part of that. So we're looking across the board at all of our processes. How can we automate them? Uh, where, where can we gain efficiencies? And then also thinking about upskilling our workforce, right? Teach, making sure that our workforce has the right training on scripting languages and the different tool platforms, uh, and being willing to invest in the uh, the workforce to to bring them up uh, and give them the right skills to ensure they know how to use the automation. Yeah, and I, and I really applaud you highlighting uh, the the uh, reaching out and and leveraging these as a service capabilities. There's just you can't hire enough women and men. Uh, to, to work your way out of this, uh, this issue, you have to automate, et cetera. So appreciate that. Richard, um, if, you, uh, if I'm sitting in a, uh, in a planning meeting at, C at CISA uh, and uh, we're talking about sort of the next evolution, you know, 3.0 of CDM, what does that look like? What, what are you expecting to do? What do you have in the in the hopper over the next two and three years that you want to take down, assuming all these other things you're doing go swimmingly well, and no question they're gonna, they have been in the past. There's no reason to think they won't. What's over the horizon? So there's a, a term that, uh, that Bruce used that I kind of want to use here, and that was latency, right? Um, but not latency necessarily in technologies and tools, but latencies in people and processes across our enterprise, the federal enterprise, right? We have to figure out a way to mount a singular defense and not a hundred plus different lines of defense, right? We got to get faster. We have to be able to collaborate more effectively. We need to be able to mount a collective defense model, right? Because when we're fragmented, both in technology tools and processes, it takes us way too long to organize a, a pernicious threat that doesn't, doesn't care about agency borders, right? They don't care of, of popping one agency. They're, they're looking to hit as many places as possible. And so we have to have a cohesive strategy to deal with that type of, a, of an attack. And, and right now, uh, we're not at a point where we can say, yes, I can coordinate amongst 102 different CISOs or different agency leaderships and mount a cohesive uh, response, right? And so you know, to, to your point, Luke, I think over the next several years, and I think the EO sets us up well for this, we have to figure out a way to, to operate at people at, at the speed of which we're being attacked. And that's a huge thing for CISA. So 
uh, that that's first in my mind, you know, to use a, a hopefully a euphemism that's too, too not far removed from the Olympics. Like this has to be a relay race and not 100 meter sprints, right? These have to be things where CISA can look at things. Uh, I'd help identify risks proactively, hand them off to agencies so they can go deal with the threat in a much more expeditious manner than we've ever done in the past. Um, hopefully the solar winds is kind of a, a, uh, a wake up call to something like that. Um, and so that's it, the people and processes, everything the other guests have said was also true, right? We have to have the right tools. They have to be trained up. They have to be operationalized. Um, they have to be stable, uh, but also let's not forget about the, the people and processes as well. Yeah, and you talked about a relay race. You know, I go back to OPM and that breach, right? We learned a lot from that across the interagency, instilled a lot of capability, then solar winds, uh, more so now the executive order. So you keep handing that baton across and keep raising the level of maturity on that coordination, that sort of one government coordination effort, uh, super important. Well, I really do appreciate uh, all that you all do uh, on behalf of protecting this country. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us on the program. I'd also like to thank the sponsors for supporting us on this show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Network that make our program so successful and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank you, the listening audience out there that tune in every month. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network.